to be here with you all. And thank you, DZine, for hosting us. I'm Spencer Bailey, author of the new book, In Memory of Designing Contemporary Memorials. Joining me here today are architect Sir David Ajay and graphic designer, design critic, and educator Michael Beirut. Neither requires uh, much introduction, especially for this audience, uh, but I did want to highlight their involvement in the making of In Memory of. When I was thinking about who should write the foreword for this book, David just immediately came to mind. Our conversations over the past decade have helped me reshape my own understanding of both memorialization and architecture. And I think of memorials at their best as poems of the built world. David's architecture really shares this sensibility. As for the book, I can't imagine a better fit than uh, Michael Beirut, who with Lightsey Ho at Pentagram effectively created a memorial in book form. Um, I'll show it here. And uh, it is literally a reflection on the very idea of reflection. Uh, first, before we get too deep into the conversation, due to the personal nature of this book, I wanted to set the stage by getting into my impetus for writing it. Um, the reality is, is that being memorialized, as I put it in the book, is a literal cast in bronze fact of my life. Um, on July 19th, 1989, then age three, I survived the crash landing of United Airlines Flight 232 in Sioux City, Iowa. 112 people, including my mom, died that day. 184, including my brother, Brandon and me survived. Thankfully, my dad and twin brother, Trent, were not on the plane. In the aftermath, a photograph by Gary Anderson of me being carried by Lieutenant Colonel Dennis Nielsen circulated widely, appearing on the front pages of newspapers and on newscasts around the world. This is that image. This photograph would take on a life of its own. Five years after the crash, a Flight 232 memorial was built on the banks of the Missouri River. The centerpiece, titled The Spirit of Siouxland, is a bronze statue by the sculptor Dale Lamphere, depicting the photo. Seeing myself in this statue remains a strange out-of-body feeling. It's still odd and in truth, probably always will be. I don't really see myself in it. Especially striking to me now is what's not at the site. Why is there no mention of the pilot, Al Haynes, who guided the aircraft to the ground? Why are there no names of other crew members or passengers? What about my mom? What about my brother? What about all of the others? At the very least, what about the dead? They should be remembered and recognized their absence should be felt. While I understand that this hero image serves as a symbol of hope and positivity for so many, I believe a different design inscribed with the names of those who lost their lives would have better captured the emotional weight of the crash while still honoring the incredible efforts of the Sioux City community. So yeah, um, <laughs> I've been dealing with and unpacking questions of memorialization for three plus decades now. And putting this book together was a way to understand what it means to memorialize something in a much greater <laughs> global context. So as we'll get into in today's conversation, I believe certain memorials built over the past four decades suggest there is another more potent and equitable way forward for honoring remembering and reflecting than traditional monuments or figurative statues, and that's abstraction, but with specificity. <laughs> so memorialization is a weighty subject that I feel difficult to do justice within an hour. We'll do our best, we'll cover a lot of ground, and uh, we'll get some questions in from the audience at the end. So let's begin. David, Michael, welcome. Thanks for Thank being you. here. Thank you. Thanks, Spencer. So Michael, I, I wanted to start with you. Could you share your approach to the design of the cover of the book? Um, yeah, th thanks, Spencer. It's um, um, 
you know, when a book designer uh, gets material for a, uh, uh, you know, it's meant to, um, uh, that we work with as we do the book. I remember first being approached by Fiden about doing the book and having this reaction. Uh, I didn't even think, it, I don't believe it had this title at that point. I just knew it was going to be about memorials. And I remember thinking, that sounds heavy. Who, who, you know, who wants to read, uh, it seems simultaneously sort of potentially depressing because it's about memorials and also kind of um, exploitive isn't quite the right word, but like, gee, look at all these cool memorials, mm -hmm. you know, which is the coffee table bookization of the subject. And, but, but what changed my, you know, what turned me around was when you got, when I got the material, including your essay, you know, I mean, it's, um, I often say that some of the worst writing in the world is the writing that kind of surrounds picture books about architecture. I mean, it just is, it's not meant to be read. It sort of has this plotting quality, you know, it's earnest and people usually just skip it. Um, uh, anyone who gets this book, I insist that you read uh, Stewart's, um, or uh, Spencer, sorry, Spencer's uh, introduction to it. it. It is such an amazing opening to a subject which is admittedly difficult and it sets the tone for the whole book and establishes the sense of analysis that Spencer is bringing to the subject at a level that I think just, uh, you know, uh, it's not just scholarly, but it has a personal element that actually is transformative. So I think we went through the same process to, to a certain degree when Lacey and I were working on the cover. We designed, you know, you, you do a lot of things that are obvious at the beginning, things that like literally in retrospect looked and felt like tombstones, things that, um, you know, were, you know, surrounded by thick black borders, things that sort of just leaned right into the idea that this was about loss, grief, uh, you know, fear, memory, pain, uh, and, and, you know, and, you know, it was like, let's just kind of like put on the outside of the package what you're going to encounter inside. But then the more we thought about it, we realized that the key word was, was memory. And memory is such a subtle thing. It's such a, um, uh, it has a certain, you know, it's it's ethereal, it's contemplative, it exists on a different sort of plane. And the images that you, the projects that you kind of collected, the images that you use to represent them, the words you surround them with, really are talking about how we as human beings use our encounters with these physical places as a way to access, you know, memory, our own memories. And it's interesting because uh, you can go to a memorial where you yourself don't even, I mean, I, I can't even, under, I can't imagine what it's like for you to, for, for you to sort of have something existing on the face of the earth, like that Sioux city Memorial and knowing your direct connection to it, Spencer, most of us don't have that relationship. And in some cases one has no relationship as time goes on, eventually the Vietnam veterans Memorial will be visited by people who, you know, who may be grandchildren of people whose names are their great grandchildren, great, great, great grandchildren, right? But like the act, but the the Vietnam War and the role it played in our history will be something just understood through textbooks and you know history classes, basically. And so those sort of physical experiences will be one of the things that remains to make those um, connections tangible. And I think. When we were working on the book, when finally we just kind of kept reducing and reducing and trying to make it into an object that almost felt, as you said, like Memorial itself, the image that we see now is actually, it's very, I'd say it's almost impossible to photograph because it's highly reflective. The words in memory of are inscribed, are debossed into the cover. And so they can be felt as well as seen. It's uh, Lacey Ho uh, did a remarkable job working with the fine production staff. Uh, uh, to bring it to life in the way that it is. And, uh, um, you know, the inside is just basically the, the images and the words are left to speak for themselves, basically. So as a book design process, once we sort of established, once we figured out a way to come up with formal choices that, that were analogs to the tone that you set so beautifully, Spencer, I think uh, it was... Um, uh, it was fairly straightforward just to kind of edit the images so that they could 
uh, have maximum impact. And I think I'm hoping that's what readers will find as they encounter it. I hear a typing. I'm not sure what the typing is, but uh, it's not me. I don't know if yeah. it's on your end. Oh, I tend to uh, shake my head around. I bet oh, it's that okay. actually. Oh, okay. I yeah. I'll it's try to I'll try to sit still. I'll, I'll try to uh, uh, subdue my excitement and uh, get things quieted <laughs> and contemplative properly for this subject. So apologies. Technology, technology. Uh, <laughs> David. You know, in the forward, you write that your making memory exhibition allowed you to think about the form of memorialization. Uh, and to explore some of the deeper meanings behind the series of uh, in your within your projects, could you elaborate on that? Like, how did organizing your thoughts on memorializing shape your thinking? Thank you. No, and um, it's really again congratulations on making this book, which I think is really a, a, a very important book to have made um, for all of us. Um, yeah, making making memory was really. Um, a clarifying moment, you know, for me in terms of having to have that time to reflect on the body of work and my concerns within this idea of memory, you know, and, and you know, when I, when I was interested in the word memory, I wasn't interested in a way that it sort of became fashionable a while ago, which was somehow in to do with like collective cliques, you know, that it's somehow some truth of something. I became really interested in the idea of memory in the way in which it encompasses, um, lots of myths and lots of ideas and actually how it's a, it's very much a construction but it, at its best it's also a device that can be really a a a, a metaphor for hope <laughs> you know memory is a kind of metaphor for hope um so you know in in the work i'm you know thinking you know i was very obviously influenced by lots of projects that i'd visited including the vietnam memorial and, and Several things that are mentioned in your, in your, in in this in this great book, um, but I really suddenly realized that for me, I was very interested in pushing past um, this narrative of the spatial confinement of what a memorial is at the moment, which is that it's somehow we make this object, and then that has to then do something to kind of ex excite a collective response, and then you know, that becomes the kind of idea. And somehow, I think by the sort of post-war, sort of late 20th century, this idea has sort of been tested and pushed to its absolute limit. Yeah. And and for me, it no longer seemed to kind of have a kind of credibility um, in terms of just being effective enough. I mean, I think there are very beautiful moments where, you know, you can never say never, but, it, you know, it, there's always somebody who makes a beautiful, beautiful object or something, and it's compelling. But um, it doesn't. It doesn't have a translatable quality that can be, you know, somehow understood much more extensively. So I started to really think about this idea of 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 memory and memorials inside of civic buildings, and part of the notion of what a public architecture um, also encompasses. And I think when I sort of made that sort of breakthrough in my own thinking, you know, which started with the Stephen Lawrence Center, sort of many years of my career, which was a building that was dedicated to a young young boy who was brutally murdered for being the wrong color in the wrong neighborhood, you know. Um, you know, how to not make an object for him, but to turn the idea of the opportunity um, of the moment, if one can say that, which is a hard thing to say, into a hope message that really speaks to, you know, his, his loss become a, became a kind of regenerating opportunity for awareness, and, and for a kind of collective sort of retraining, which happens through the instrumentalization of the building. Um, and so the building is not just a functional object that's just pretty and you know nice materials and details. It really deals with moving into this other blurry area of you know allowing certain things to happen. And, and, and that has been a kind of constant since that. And right through, you can see it's sort of you know, apex for me in, in, in the Smithsonian and the National Museum of African American History and Culture, where this idea of the building as memorial, as monument, as a museum is kind of working across the brief and reaching into, for me, conditions which are about the 21st century and the complexities of our democracies and our civilizations and where we are now and, and how we want to, to, we want, you know, for civilization, we need something that carries us, carries us with this idea of learning from from what we do, <laughs> but we you know, but we also need it to be flexible enough to be able to be open and not so controlling, 
so that its master narrative is kind of captured by one extreme group or the other. Mm. You know, so I think that that exhibition really clarified for me the evolution of this form and that actually architecture really uh, was at a moment where it could no longer just avoid this collision, that the actual opportunity of making a building was also an act of memory and an act of consolidation. And, and most of the time in civic buildings was an act of hope. Mm. This is a great segue into where I wanted to go next. Um, <laughs> we, 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 um, before we get into the, the last four years of memorial making, I wanted to briefly add a bit of context to how we got to where we are. Um, and especially notable in this conversation, I think, is Auguste Rodin's 1884 commission to create a monument to the burghers of Calais. Um, so I'm going to present that here. Um, th this, this is something that came across uh, sort of the research I was doing into memorials when um, I read a piece by Michael Kimmelman in the New York Times that he had written in 2002. It's a, it's a really astute piece. And he notes in it that this was a common man memorial, that this, these aren't heroic figures. You know, these are, these are figures that are tired or struggling, they're gaunt, that, but they're persevering. And so there's something, especially for its time, that's quite abstract about this, this image. Um, fast forward a few decades, another memorial in this context worth mentioning is, is Brancusi's Endless Column Memorial. Um, in Targuju, Romania, it was completed in 1938 and dedicated to the soldiers who died fighting off the Germans from that town during World War I. That same year, Brancusi completed that memorial. Lewis Mumford wrote this essay that's fairly well referenced in terms of, um, you know, uh, the, the writing that's been done about memorials. It's called The Death of the Monument, and in it, he writes, the notion of a modern monument is a contradiction in terms. If it is a monument, it is not modern. And if it is modern, it cannot be a monument. Pretty ahead of his time, I would say, yeah. in, his, in his arguments. Um, and the, this, this, it, it sort of gets at this distinction between a monument, a more figurative interpretation, and a memorial, which is something with an abstract bent, something that, that can kind of it's more evocative. Um, so on this front, <laughs> another memorial I wanted to bring up was and highlight is Isamu Noguchi's sculpture to be seen from Mars. Uh, this is a, a design he came up with in 1947. Uh, <laughs> and what's special to me about this, in addition to the fact that it was just this really ambitious idea, you know, a 10 mile long earthwork, depicting an abstract human face. <laughs> um, and though he never completed it, I think it reveals a sort of radical way of showing how we're all interconnected as a species. It was his message to the outside. Um, you know, it was, it was stemming out of the atomic bombings from World War II, which horrified him and, and got him thinking about these end of mankind scenarios. Um, it, it, we run a small thumbnail image of this in the book, um, and, and there are a couple of Gucci memorials in the book as well. He was a quite a prolific memorial maker. He designed uh, 15 in his, in his lifetime, five of which were completed. Um, this one, though, is the one that stands out as the most remarkable to me, even though all that remains of it is basically this picture of a model he had done in sand. Um, and so the idea, I think, of, of showing um, showing how interconnected we are, showing the sort of ambition of, of, uh, of civilization in a way that's communicating to the outside is a, is a really uh, sort of profound thing. Um, in the wake of World War II, architects and artists increasingly experimented with forms like this, these sort of non-figurative forms or verging on, on figurative. Um, and I think it was a result of many things. Uh, it's a question I've gotten quite a bit in, term, in terms of, of how did we get here? And, and, and I think a little bit, it's, it's the counterculture of the 60s and 70s, the evolution of abstract art. You have you know, minimalism, greater sophistication in psychology. With Vietnam, you had post-traumatic stress disorder become part of the dialogue. You had shifts in religion and spirituality. You had the rise of victim culture, especially in the US. Um, it all sort of created this perfect storm for memorialization. 
And in the last two decades of the 20th century, as Kimmelman points out in that piece, minimalism kind of became this, um, you know, almost sub rosa became this uh, uh, thing that, that was very common in memorials. So I'm curious from both of you, Mike, Michael and David, how do you each view these shifts that, that uh, I've talked about here? Aside from what I highlighted, like what are some of the reasons you think minimalism and abstraction took over? Um, Spencer, I, I, in, in David's essay, he starts out by talking about storytelling as what these, um, what these memorials are really meant to do. And I think you mentioned, in fact, in, in your introduction, they both have to be universal and they have to be specific. And, you know, the, the Noguchi, you know, you know, memorial to be seen from Mars, you know, it's fun. You know, I mean, it's and it's on one hand, it's sort of the premise of it is preposterous, but it has within it kind of this amazing, you know, potential for a story. You know, who is on Mars viewing us? What is it that they're seeing? What is it that how do we appear, you know, as a species to others? And it sort of starts to, you know. It, it writes its own story just in its title in a way. And I think mm -hmm. um, um, just as um, every field of creative endeavor got more abstract and less, you know, the stories kind of were, you know, the universal universalization of the stories inevitably kind of, I think, got reflected in the kind of abstract nature of their telling. I think that actually happened with, um, uh, you know, with memorial making as well. And, um, you know, if, if uh, Maya Lin's uh, Vietnam Memorial was sort of a watershed in the whole thing, one of the things that's most remarkable about that was what she submitted to the competition which is so extraordinarily abstract, like far more abstract than the actual experience of the built memorial. Uh, you know, I, you have to credit the people that were who were in the room, you know, Harry Weiss and the other judges who sort of uh, were able to kind of look at that drawing and just fathom what she what her intentions were uh and um you know and and anticipate how extraordinary that sense of storytelling would be and in fact it's a very you know the, the story is like very um you know uh, uh almost literal you sort of start shallow you go deeper and deeper as you walk down that slope you know if you want to be a literalist it's exactly sort of what people said was happening in that particular war um, you know, as the names begin to kind of pile up higher and higher, for lack of a better phrase, um, you know, it, in a way, it's it's sure it's abstract and was kind of uh, reviled by some for being insufficiently heroic. But as a, um, you know, as an abstract analog for what the emotional journey was that it was represented by so many people that, you know, that were you know, that were victims of that war and participated in the war and were touched by that war, it actually ended up being something that was really potent as we know now. So I think that kind of abstraction does have that capacity. Yeah. I mean, I look at this memorial in so many ways. It's not just a wedge in the earth and a wedge in the National Mall, but a wedge into memorial culture. I mean, it was, it was really kind of redefining what a memorial could be. And over time, and despite critics, I think that you know, Lynn's memorial has really shown how abstraction, especially when done with this level of specificity, can be an incredibly effective tool. David, uh, would you would you like to sort of elaborate on this um, uh, evolution that we're talking about here? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree and concur. Um, I think you said a lot. I, I was going to say that, you know, there is a specific trajectory of minimalism, which is very different to how it operates when it moves into memorials or to architecture. Um, Cause I, and I think that nuance is, you know, this narrative part that is very much, you know, you know, Judd would never have narrative part of his work or none of the minimalists I know would have narrative as part of their work. So, so it is, it is a kind of more, it's a, I, I would say that it starts off with where minimalism starts off with, with the idea of a spatial experience, I think. And I think that, you know, this idea of the spatial experience linked to the sort of, the way in which our senses are kind of shifted and then you know different chemicals are released in our minds has been the trigger 
you know, that's, you know, this, that, that we've realized that actually the, the act of the memorialization of something requires the sentient body to be in motion. <laughs> I think that this is a critical sort of part of this or in some kind of engagement, whether it's, you know, leaning up or just looking in, but it's, it's, it's that action which kind of fires off a lot of things. And if, if it aligns with a narrative that allows anybody to, um, to sort of play their own role within this, then I think the sparks happen. And I think that, you know, I, I love, you know, I'm happy with starting with minimalism, but I think it's something a little bit more than that. <laughs> so I, you know, it's, it's something has happened and it has been spatialized. And I think that what it's really talking about is that as human beings, I think that we're ritual, opt we, we ritualize things. And, you know, if you take a look at the root of ritualizing, it's kind of about an action, you know, it's an action. And we're returning to actions as a way of memorializing. You know, the Catholic Church was really good at it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I want to I keep things moving forward because we have so much to cover. Um, I wanted to bring up Berlin, uh, yeah. a city I know, David, you know quite well. And yeah. uh, Ber Berlin's memorial landscape uh, it's just so fascinating to me. It's like every corner in Berlin is a memorial practically. And I was there about a year ago and visited six Holocaust or Holocaust related memorials in one day, which is difficult experience, but also very moving. When, you, when you're there, you sort of get to feel that there's a, an impact that, that hits everybody on the street in some way. And so I'm wondering what sort of impact do you think that has had? Um, and this question is for both of you on Berlin, on German culture and internationally, like I'm thinking, David, of your, your idea of memorials as an act of unforgetting. Like there's so much unforgetting going on in, in Berlin. Um, David, you, you know Berlin well, you go first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to be respectful because I just spoke. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's it's really interesting. Um, I think that Berlin has sort of concretized, you know, I mean, by being the sort of agent of probably the kind of greatest horror um, of our sort of idea of civilization in terms of, you know, the sort of slaughtering that we know of, that we can remember. You know, it sort of has become the sort of nerve point of this idea of activating a kind of, um, I call it the kind of, it's the truth and reconciliation sort of city <laughs> that is sort of, you know, I think also at this very interesting kind of juncture, because Berlin is really a kind of an enlightenment city, you know, planned as a kind of very much this, you know, sort of 18th century sort of idea, that unfolds and then the 20th century crashes into it. And then it really, I think, picks up this idea post, you know, post war of then also having to deal with this condition of this new phenomena, which is that it's not just enough to, you know, uh, you know, how do you how do you turn this the entire city into an act of acknowledging this um, this this horror? Uh, you know, and, it, and it's a sort of, it's, you know, it's sort of done as a way to be a kind of truth and reconciliation. It's sort of slightly like this city will now be, so, if I can say the word, condemned with this, you know, held by it, but at the same time also redeemed by it. Because by being held by it, it's sort of somehow atoning for the kind of worst horror that any, you know, person can remember in sort of memory. Um, so it's a kind of fascinating for me city to spatially kind of engage with, you know, and, you know, we go from the Holocaust even right through to, you know, the separation and the reunification and the memorials to that. It is a kind of perfect city of this incredible, you know, set of forces of the late 20th century or the, the you know, the, the last 300 years of our civilization, really, I would say, yeah. kind of collecting into this kind of, Fulcrum point. And I think what it does is that it actually points us to how we maybe, you know, people think of cities very much just in terms of commercial, um, you know, like real estate, you know, that the economies are driven by residential real estate and that's all you need. 
And actually, I think what Berlin does, you know, because I actually in a funny sort of way, Berlin has also become incredibly romantic for artists and for a lot of thinkers. It has this trauma, but it also has this incredible romance. Because I think that in a weird way, it starts to become like a Rome in Europe for me. You know, it sort of has, it's a city with these layers of stuff that are not to do with the commercial activity, but to do with the civilization and what the civilization, yes, did wrong, but also how it's also kind of atoning for it. And I think that it makes a very fascinating thing that I think we have to learn from in the 21st century about mm -hmm. how we acknowledge all the kind of complexities that are coming at us now, you know, with what the 21st century is doing at incredible speed. And what does that mean in terms of our cities? Are cities just an habitation and economic spaces? Or are they also something more that speak about our civilization and who we want to be? So I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, without speaking to anything specifically, I, you know, I was, I spent a decade really analyzing Berlin and really just being absolutely taken by uh, the way in which this city really kind of encapsulates, you know, 300 years of, you know, European development and, and, and also trauma into a form. Yeah, and I think uh, what what strikes me about it as an example is, um, you know, uh, David mentions like truth and reconciliation, and um, you know, as an American, I'm struck by, in a way, our reluctance to do that at the civic level. If you think of the the injustice and trauma of slavery, and how for you know, for for years and years and years, the way that the Civil War was memorialized was not by acknowledging the, um, you know, the trauma and injustice of slavery, but instead was, uh, um, you know, the, the valorization of the lost cause Confederacy, you know, and that was, you know, I mean, you talk about uh, memorialization as storytelling, that was a very, very deliberate attempt to tell a very specific story about what that part of history was, and I and and what's remarkable is you sort of, in a way, uh, there's a kind of, of 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 artistic justice in the fact that those statues this past summer and over the course of this year, as you know, this wave of protests occurred. Um, in the wake of the murders of George Floyd and others, um, you know, that, that they provided like a focal point for those protests, you know, of, of, you know and, um, uh, you know, in a way that's uh, perhaps that's a way for memorials to function as well. They don't always have to be, um, you know, they can be, they can catalyze things in a way that can be positive, they can be negative, but they're, again, it's sort of, I, I, I really think that when David's talking about the physical relationship you have to them, the fact that, you know, um, you know, memory is, you know, by definition insubstantial, yet these physical objects that we can encounter at human scale exist, you know, those are what we have to reckon with at moments, uh, where suddenly these huge social shifts are happening. And I think in a way, a place like Berlin, a country like Germany, they've sort of, you know, uh, they've, they have not hesitated to really um, devote so much civic space to those kinds of subjects. I think the, you know, here in the United States, it, it's, it's curious how it just seems to have been for a lot of our history, antithetical to our nature or uh, just a way for the dominant culture to make sure that uh, history was remembered a very specific way, as opposed to a different way or in a, in a more uh, a truer, more more just way. Well, this this brings up a, a point I wanted to address, which is you know we're, we're facing this national reckoning of systemic racism. It's clear that memorials and museums too can offer a way to address some of this dark history to to understand it more deeply slavery, lynchings. Um, in the book, there's there are two memorials, one in France, one in America, that definitely go deep into slavery and lynching, um, the memorial to the abolition of slavery in Nantes in France, and uh, Mass Design Group's Memorial for Peace and Justice with the equal, um, <clears throat> with the uh, Brian Stevenson's Equal Justice Initiative, which I'll uh, show here. 
I wanted to ask um, David, what, what do you think, you know, or why do you think there are so few memorials about relating to or acknowledging slavery? And what do you think we can do about this? Like, how, how can we reshape this narrative? I mean, I think I think it's clear to everyone that, um, you know, I mean, I think Michael explained it very carefully and clearly why it happened. It was about a dominant group's, you know, a desire to not have to confront this this mm. horror, you know, and it is a horror when you look at it. It's it's as dark as it gets, you know, um, and um, and you know, one way to do it is to hope that you can rewrite history, and and clearly that does not work. It fails. Uh, in fact, what you do is that you create a sort of what I call it a sort of trail, you know, of of information which leads back to the sort of fissure of the wound. Um, and that's what's happening. And I think that that's what's been exactly happening as Michael kind of talked about it. Um, that there's this, you know, kind of horrific wound that has just been ignored. <laughs> And the problem is it can't heal until you deal with it um, in some way. And the way to deal with it, I think that's why Germany is very interesting, is that by having it become so physicalized, there's no more discussion about the fact that it's being dealt with mm. and that you have to go through it to go to the next stage. You can't ignore this. It still doesn't stop hate. It does, as we see, Germany still has you know, neo-Nazis everywhere and it's, you know, in, in, in percentages that are worrying, et cetera. But, but they can't avoid, you know, they try to use fake history, fake news or whatever else, but they can't avoid the fact that the state acknowledges the problems. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I, this I, is... I feel like if every American or, or at least U.S. citizen went and visited the Memorial for Peace and Justice, they couldn't not be moved there. They couldn't not feel yeah. something and respond some way. And yeah. I think that that's what's so important about these sites. Yeah. If you just if you just made a monument to the horror of slavery in every community that it happened, every generation from that community would have to now negotiate that and would know that this was really an issue. The reverse is where you create ignorance and then an incredible sort of memory loss, which then leads to horrific, you know, collisions of 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 you know culture, which I just, I mean, when you look at it, you sort of think, really, did, did somebody think this could actually work? Mm. Uh, but I think, you know, it also goes through to the whole idea of understanding black people as not really part of mainstream life. <laughs> they were the background. <laughs> so maybe you could do it <laughs> until you had to acknowledge, you know, that you were talking about your fellow human beings, your fellow brother and sister through blood and DNA and through evolution. Mm. Um, and once you do, the thing comes smack into your face. And, um, and I think that it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing project that I think Europe and America is, you know, and also South America, you know, and wherever slavery has happened, you know, whether it's in the Middle East or, or in Asia, it has to be dealt with. And in Africa, where if it happens, it has to be dealt with. It's part of the, the cathartic kind of reckoning that is critical if your civilization is to have any credibility in saying that we have learned and have moved on. It's not enough to say it. It's, it's you have to also make it part of what you are. Because mm. the act has happened. History's happened. Can't remove that. So what do you do? The truth, what I call the truth and reconciliation moment. You can't just say, oh, well, it was not our generation or whatever. You have to do something about it. And it has to be impactful enough to kind of say that you are you are having a truth and reconciliation about this issue. And, you know, it doesn't matter who decides they're not going to believe it. It's going to have to be dealt with. And it's happening at the highest level of our civilization. Mm. On, on the subject of the Black diaspora, David, I'm wondering if you could talk about, you know, and we're talking about such an international thing here. Um, in terms of understanding slavery internationally, not just as, a, as an American phenomenon. I'm wondering, could you talk about how you understand the Black diaspora through your design work? Like, what was your approach specifically with the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture 
this was a building for African American culture, but you understood it as something much, much, much larger than that, um, or understood the the term African American to mean something much larger. Could you speak about how you embedded this idea into it, like the very idea of the memorial into this building? I I mean I think that you know we we talked about this um, Spencer and and it is a very important thing for me, which is that you know essentially to decouple even the notion of slavery as a specific mm -hmm. thing that only belongs to a certain group that was traumatized is also to misunderstand and to sort of use language to sort of hide behind the kind of what actually happened. What happened was this recognition or this acknowledgement by a group of European powers that Africa was to be had. It was then extracted and then colonized. And the double, the twins are slavery and colonization. Mm -hmm. And basically that creates the two ruptures that happen, you know, and one sort of has a kind of effect and impact in America, which is horrific, but essentially it's about the kind of extraction of the black identity from civilization. Right? So, you know, they're not part of it, but actually, you know, we're going to use them for everything, including their land. Mm. And then what you do is that by that sort of divide, you've then also kind of, you know, created this condition of, oh, this is a separate thing to what's going on in Africa. And, and, and what I wanted to kind of say is that, you know, that in this building is that actually this whole thing is about a reflection of people from the continent of Africa who are culturally being made into this subhuman group and used and manipulated for the betterment of the West to grow economically and powerfully in terms of resource and people. And so, you know, it, for me, the project was about linking the story, not just about slavery, but also to the kind of fundamental twin evil that I think is the kind of moment that needs to be, you know, uh, dealt with um, in the building, you know, that it's, it's about this whole trajectory. So it's not to in any way reduce any, but to kind of understand the complexity. And I think once you understand these twins, you know, colonial uh, colonization and slavery, you understand the black diaspora and its multitude, wh whether it's European sort of diaspora or South American diaspora or, you know, American diaspora, the Caribbean diaspora. This is the twin system that decouples the thing. And in a way, the building tried to bring them together in a way, even though the story is not being told by the form and the content. You know, and, and I think it triggers then a kind of reawakening about the, the master narrative of this thing, I hope. You know, I think what it's done for a lot of people is to really reflect more deeply on this um, and not just make it an us and them, but a real kind of, you know, discussion about what was that history 400 years ago and, and, and why do we need to learn from it now? And I think architecture, you know, people think that you're trying to make an, you know, the architecture is a, again, like the memorial, it is a moment where the architecture is acting as a device to unveil the story, you know, and it, it threads a very fine line and it uses abstraction and it uses storytelling. It uses, you know, literal things, but it shifts them into built form. And, you know, it's a fine line. It could, you know, it's, it's not Disney, <laughs> yeah. but it, you know, it's a fine, fine line. You know, it's not mimicry, but it is about storytelling and it's about construction, space, you know, poetics and storytelling. So I want to uh, finish on Louis Kahn's memorial uh, for Freedom. The best. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then we'll have a few audience questions. Um, you know, for me, this is like a bridge between two centuries. It was designed at the end of the 20th century. Um, I believe Louis Kahn actually had these drawings on him when he when he uh, died. And, oh wow! And it's <clears throat> and it's now this incredible reflection of the present moment too. So there's this there's this great tension between these two centuries happening. Um, the fact that it was realized posthumously, you know, nearly you know 40 years after his death. So material, form, content, subject matter, all these things we're talking about, they coalesce into this masterwork. I'm curious, um, Michael, could you 
talk about your thoughts on the park and then david i know you're a big fan of con so i, I want to hear what you you think about the park as well yeah well i'm a big fan of louis cons as well and maybe who isn't uh um <laughs> there's something um you know what's interesting about the about this this particular memorial and i think it actually reflects back on the book is that um uh, the selections are beautifully curated, but they also paint a picture of very different attitudes about what's being memorialized. You know, what you're encountering, you're, what you're being invited to do here, at least as I've taken it personally, isn't really, you know, it's not about coming to grips with some trauma, the trauma of FDR's death. You know, uh, it's not coming to grips with, uh, um, you know, it's, it's it's as much a tribute to his vision as memorialization, but a tribute specifically to an idea that he had about uh, uh, fairness and equity in the United States that he put into action, you know, during his four terms as president, right? And and so in a way, it's extremely uplifting. It's extraordinarily abstract, you know, in terms of. Uh, you know, I have to constantly remind myself that it actually sits on Roosevelt Island and Roosevelt Island is, you know, named after, you know, shares, shares the same name as the person that this memorial is for. And, um, you know, otherwise, you know, it sort of is um, as, you know, it's about as profoundly abstract about just idealism and optimism and a dream of what a society can be. Um, and it, it really delivers that very powerfully just the, you know, anyone, you know, as any, anyone who's ever taken a drawing class and understood what one point perspective was, you know, <laughs> you know, it, it delivers that lesson with such pointed directness and you really understand the power of, of depth and distance and what's close to us and what's far away and kind of creates this beautiful kind of metaphor that I think goes back to your idea of, um, of memory, Spencer. So I think it's just really, um, you know, in a way with the greatest economy of means is able to, um, you know, evoke feelings that are very, very strong. Yeah, no, I, I, I think this memorial is uh, probably one of my most favorite, it's probably one of my favorite memorials in the world. Um, and um, simply because of uh, the fact that you know, I think what you what you are seeing is a masterclass in in you know here is the subject matter is so vast and so sort of you know esoteric in terms of what you grasp, but it is about idealism and it is about hope in humanity. And I think what Khan does is to really use nature and the elements to remind you of your humanity and a potential purpose. You know, and he does it by understanding this notion of movement and also this idea of our, our, you know, the things that make us human, our perception, that he uses perception as the tool to bring you to this incredible point. You know, I mean, you could walk to that room. If there was none of the other stuff, you would go past it and not think anything of it. But he sets up this unbelievable, um, sort of narrative of perfection, this alleys of trees making these beautiful perspectives. It's almost like going into heaven, you know, it's like a heavenly thing, you know, and then you rise up and then there's this thing and just, and what, what is amazing about Khan is, you know, always for me, every time I see any of his projects is the way he's able to understand wherever he is in the world, how to use that part of the world to essentialize an incredible elemental human quality, because if that view had faced anything else, it would have been horrific. And he takes you to the, the current flowing down and the water's edge, the brow, so that you suddenly have this emotional relationship to the, what I, you know, the cleansing power of water, sort of actually redeeming you when you get to that journey's end. I mean, I like it's it's like it's a movie. <laughs> it's so good, and you know, it's it's so unphotographic, which I love. You know, you take photographs, and people just don't understand. It's like lots of slabs of stone. It is about the movement, mm -hmm. and you know, we we are so image driven about what we think memorials are by pictures, and we forget that it's actually about the movement and the trajectory and the way in which we see and engage with things that actually creates the the electricity in our brains that kind of makes us 
yeah, kind I mean, of, which was know, a huge challenge. <laughs> it was a huge challenge with making the book. I, I, you know, one of the things that I thought a lot about was how do you make that lived experience felt through the text, if not through the images, and how do you make it feel like you're there and that you're able to respond emotionally to these sites? It's sort of why I decided to establish these sort of five alternate readings of the same book. This notion, which I love. Yeah, this mm. notion that you could experience five different emotions in the same place, because that's the complexity that is, you know, inherent or underlying a lot of these sites. So in the interest of time, I want to um, finish here, David, with, with a project you have in the works. Um, it's the Martyrs Memorial in Niger. Could you talk about this project, um, how it came about, what it's memorializing, and what your hopes are for the design, like the sort of approach and, and concept behind it? Yeah, no, I mean, this is a project that I'm very, you know, committed to and very excited about, and it's happening now, and it'll be open next, you know, next spring, summer. Um, and uh, essentially, it is, you know, an ongoing issue in Africa, which is to do with, you know, the ISIS, you know, uh, problem, extremism, extremism in societies, and, you know, the people that have to defend against that extremism to keep our democracies and our liberal democracies the way in which we we have all agreed we want to have it, you know, and and essentially it's about you know a, a, you know I think it's a three decade war that's been happening in that part of the world to hold back these sort of fringe groups who want to take over societies and bring them into a certain sort of order ex extreme view, and and also to understand that actually after that kind of time for a community. These are, these are the realities that you need to understand in these places uh, that are very much affecting the kind of cultural and psychological framework. So the Ministry of Defense you know, reached out to, to me through the mayor's office in Niger to, to, to put a monument in the center of the city. Um, but they didn't want just a monument, you know, here, nice, you know, they could have just got somebody to put something. They wanted something that would speak to the resilience of the city, but also create something that would start to re-ascribe also the, the growth of the city as well. So this is a monument which is de dealing with trauma and memory for those who've lost, you know, the families that have lost their, you know, their brothers and sisters who were killed in the war. But also, this is also about creating a resilience in, in you know, a, a space of feeling hope that there is a sense that one is protected, but also there is a system that wants to hold on to this thing. And, and at the same time, you know, um, I wanted very much to create something that spoke to the very specificity of the place and also create a, a, an everyday quality to it, which is then this um, public room. So I, we invented, we added this program of the public room, but essentially what you're looking at are these, it's this grid of those martyred as these kind of totemic foams that rise to the sky, sort of in perspective. And this tilting plane, which is, you know, learning the great lessons about using the atmosphere. The tilting plane is simply to allow the backdrop of the colonnade of, of these, 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 these obelisks, if I can call them that, to only have the sky and to, to remove the city, because it's right in the heart of the city. Mm. So it was like, I didn't want to see any buildings, so that's the tilt that you get up. And then what you realize is that these are not just sort of objects on their own, but they're also giant thermal shafts that completely environmentally condition the space of the public arena, which is in this labyrinth space. And this labyrinth space, not as a kind of, you know, for me, Western idea of a kind of open space, but the idea of the colonnade and the labyrinth as a very Islamic idea of the civic, you know, the mosque is a grid, a representation of the people as these columns in their public space. And so that is kind of recreated or as a kind of social civic space, which then, you know, has these. So it's basically an environmental sort of extractor. It's a series of solar chimneys, but it's also this idea of the gravity. So it's the everyday and it's also the gravity of the kind of loss, which then creates a beacon in the center of the city for uh, the community and really to look look towards the regeneration of of their city, which is happening very fast. N N Nigeria is also changing; it's developing and becoming a city that's growing and becoming a very important West African city. And and it'll be completed next year, correct? Yes, it'll be completed late spring. Great. So yeah, it's already so started. 
audience questions. Uh, we Someone named Elaine has written in, um, should memorials be treated like a pilgrimage or are they better happened upon? I'd love to hear both your answers on this one. Michael? What, that's, that, what a great question that is. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously it's, I, I mean, I, I think both seem perfectly valid. And I think, um, in a way when, you know, I was very interested when Dave was talking before about like Berlin as the new Rome, you know, what you encounter in a city like Rome is these layers of history where, you know, you'll, you know, in a way the, the trap is to be overly focused on, you know, the greatest hits and the real joy of exploring a city like that are the things you happen upon, right? Uh, that might not be mentioned in your tourist guidebook, right? And I think, um, uh, you know, uncovering memory in a city or in any civic space is something that, um, you know, that obviously you can, um, you know, can be, can, can actually be really instructive and really powerful if it's, if a certain, if it's serendipitous and if you're taken by surprise by it, let's say at the same time. And I think Dave, and I'm not going to speak for you, but I think part of what you're talking about when you're conceiving the work that you do is that these places are meant to be in fact, um, destinations for pilgrims that they create rooms that people can gather in and have a common experience. They're not drawn there by accident, but in fact, there's an intentionality behind them and you're locating, you know, in a city, in a community, in a, in a nation, a place where a particular, um, subject can be addressed. You don't come, like, for instance, you don't come upon that con memorial to FDR by accident. You know, you're not yeah. strolling around Roosevelt, Roosevelt Island, and then you just kind of get to the southernmost tip. You go there because you want to, you're, you're drawn there. At the same time, it's positioned exactly as David said, so you're compelled to be drawn there, even if you're not sure why, sort of. So, um, so I think the answer might be both, but I'd really be interested in hearing how David thinks of it as an architect, because I oh. think... Yeah, go ahead. No, I, I actually think you answered it perfectly. Uh, <laughs> so I don't think I need to add any more to that, actually, Michael. I think you answered it perfectly. Let, let's, let's go into the next question. <laughs> so the next question is, is what goes into the decision to allow a viewer room for interpretation when constructing a memorial versus, say, a more pedantic or literal representation of an event? That's a really good question. You know, why, why add more? You know, and um, I, I think that because um, we are learning that, that, you know, it's not possible to, to simplify history. <laughs> I think that we're learning that, you know, this idea of reducing history to a one-liner, he conquered or he destroyed, is really a gross misrepresentation. And so the notion of the memorial just simply as a, as a kind of singularity, I think is, is so difficult for people to just hold on to. You know, I think you can just about do that with a singular event only that has a singular set of actors in it. Maybe you can still do that, just. <laughs> you know, um, uh, you know, and I think that's the only condition that I can think of. But I think that almost everything that deals with any part of history is so loaded that it's now becoming it's becoming spatialized, and it is, it's becoming something that needs reflection and constant adjustment mm. for it to be successful. I think, um, you know, of course, you can say no, you know, you don't need it, and and you know, what we have is a history up to the twenty first century of exactly no, you don't need it. And look at what it's producing. It's producing the very things that are unsatisfactory. So I think in the 21st century, we have to do more. We have to do these things better. And, you know, I think that, you know, for me, some of the things, and I love when you just were speaking about Rome. I, you know, I lived in Rome for a bit. And I, one of the things I loved so much was the way in which absolutely there's the greatest hits. But, but the history of the city is this layering that you can experience in so many ways. You know, you can go to catacombs and wander. You can go down, you know, every church has a kind of space that has more information. And so actually there is precedent already of how the richness of that creates an incredible backdrop to the civic life of a city and empowers and, you know, gives, I think, backbone to the citizens that they really are living in a city that's in the past, but also in the future and in the present. You know, I, I love this idea that a city you know, for me, for it to be rich, has to be able to kind of 
bridge the three perceptions of our sense of ourselves in the world, the past, the present, and the future. Last question. Uh, what are some of the challenges of honoring the lives of those lost in war without glorifying the war itself? Um, that is a tough one, obviously. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, it's, I mean, and I, I really think back on the, you know, the, the all the controversy that attended the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was perceived as being a monument to defeat and loss, as opposed to a valorization of the courage of, you know, the men and women that died there. And what's funny, I mean, maybe it goes back to the previous question slightly, you know, what 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 makes it's what makes that experience so powerful, and what makes a, a memorial potentially so powerful is its capacity to work, to be both and somehow, and it requires a certain level of ex, of, of ex, abstraction, in fact, to function as two things simultaneously. And it may just be that um, you know, you know, this relaxing one attempts to control and dictate the narrative and opening it up to the kind of interpretation that Dave was talking about a moment ago. Maybe that's the key to the uh, to the question, right? Couldn't agree more. And again, once again, slam dunk, Michael. <laughs> 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 well, we're all out of time, but thank you so much for joining us. Thank you both for being here. It, it's, uh, it means so much to me to, to have you involved with the book. It, it really is like a dream team. I could not be happier. Um, thanks to Dezine for partnering on this event. And I hope everyone who, who tuned in considers getting the book, which you can find on fightin.com or wherever books are sold. Um, yeah, thanks again and um, have a great day. Thank you, Spencer. Thanks, David. Thank you.